I believe it's time to start. So um, welcome to everybody who's looking at our uh, familiar monument from Manhattan as if he were parting the traffic for us on Fifth Avenue. Um, this statue of General Sherman from the beginning of the 20th century, although it largely alludes to the Civil War. That I looked at last time, but I want to say a little more. Um, I think we will go, be going all over the place in this last hour of the class. <laughs> what I want to say about this figure is first, um, to bring attention to the artist, that's um, Augustus St. Gaudens, who was um, considered, is considered the um, sort of the premier American sculptor of the um, later 19th century. And he had um, a fine education. He'd also studied at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. So he would have been um, steeped in reverence for the classical tradition. And certainly that is part of the source of his decision, not merely to show the general on his horse, but to include the, the figure who's at, sort of leading the way, who is victory. And she's of course, based on the, I say, of course, based on the winged victory of Samothrace that you saw at the beginning of this class, several lectures ago, and on the Marcus Aurelius, which you also seen. So it, um, it calls on the whole tradition of triumphal monuments. And the class of people who would have um, paid for this sculpture, the wealthy, Manhattan businessmen and other associates of uh, General Sherman would undoubtedly be familiar with them. So in looking at this statue, they could frame his exploits in terms of the whole grand tradition of, of victors um, and in the grand tradition of art. So it had that extra understanding among those who understood. And then who could not understand that this was a triumphant figure? With the, it's, the, the sculptors pulled out all the stops to have that utter nonsense of imagining that the cloak would flare back like that, um, just in that kind of curve over his shoulder as if there were a strong breeze on him. And the breeze is, part of inspiration, of determination, perhaps. And uh, likewise, that it carries through to the horse's tail that way. And the horse is being so extremely spirited. Now, this I'll pass on from my reading because I know nothing about my about horses. I usually have my sister-in-law here for that. But uh, <clears throat> evidently, someone who knew the sculptor, knew General Sherman, said, there would never be a horse like this because that horse would be falling over. The way the the back hoof is up also is, I guess, not really plausible. But which hoof is, hoof is forward? Well, of course, it's because of this. And you see this one just barely rests on the ground. So it's quite explicitly derived from that. That figure. And it's not enough that it should be bronze. Like the Marcus Aurelius, it has to be gilded bronze. And that very strong contrast with the Gettysburg Monument of his great rival, I guess you would say, his enemy. Um, where you have Robert E. Lee on his horse and the Virginia 
um, ordinary folk who fought being symbolized down here. But now it's true the sculptor who did this is, is not a named figure. So you can say, oh, well, he doesn't, not as good. But if you just look at the image and figure it's not a matter of the artist, you see how completely contained this is, how absolutely still, uh, how stoical he's presented here as he would be um, where this is placed uh, on horseback looking out at his troops who are being decimated because they have followed his battle plan. So the um, it doesn't have any of that heroism. It has just the painful, quiet, inner something. So that it's also expressive. And the expression, of course, is more overt in the men down below in their slightly more desperate expressions on their faces because this is a monument to, to men who were defeated in battle, but it shows that though defeated, they fought heroically. And I want to show you one other monument from Gettysburg. I'm sure you know there are many, 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 many. But uh, this one is also a, a Confederate monument. And it's the first Confederate monument that was put up. You can sort of make out what, what the group is down here. It's, it's the Confederate Second Maryland Infantry Monument. And it's from 1884, so it's earlier than these others. There's no imagery on this except for, I believe that's just the Maryland State Seal. And I'll show you what's on the back and also the side, one side has more. Just inscription describing what happened, who fought, the whole circumstances of the event. So you have to get up close to it to interact. And the content of this that who would know, except those who already know, is that this unit called the Second um, Maryland Infantry, that was painful. And in fact, someone has written in here, um, saying in here, first Maryland changed to, and then the letters that stand out in bold. Because there were, this is a story. There were two first Maryland units. Maryland as a state was on the Union side. And it's just this group of men who, who confederated to form uh, one unit that fought with the Confederates. So when this monument was put up, they were not allowed to use the name of their unit, the name under which they fought. They said, no, that's reserved for the Union troops. So the commission and handle in charge of all the battle monuments said, no, you, we will now call you the second infantry. So in a sense, this is like a, there's a monument but in our modern language of erasure, this is a group that was erased, not only by having no image there for us, but that they lost the name that was their identity. This is a statue that's in Philly. Some of you may have, that would be nice if some of you had said, well, I've seen that, but I didn't see it in Philly. We're now looking at a World War I monument and it's called the um, Spirit of the American Doughboy by a man whose name is Vikesny, otherwise not really known in art, but this figure was very well known. And this is, um, represents something that's changing 
partly is the historical change, a change in the country, uh, a change in the culture. Uh, Vikesny, who um, came from the Middle West, he wanted to be a sculptor. His father said, no, I mean, you know, you never make money as an artist and wouldn't support him. But he got a job in um, Georgia carving um, gravestones for men who'd been imprisoned in the Andersonville um, prison during, during the uh, Civil War. He wouldn't get his fame from that either, but it was his idea. And here's American ingenuity at its best. He says, you know, ordinary people not, are not going to want monuments just of generals. They want some way to memorialize their sons, their neighbors, the men who went and fight in World War I, this cataclysmic, unexpected, un, unimaginable war. So he said, I'm going to meet that need. And he started to work on this image of the doughboy. Now, that name, it really just uh, was a nickname for, um, for American infantrymen. And uh, he had a couple of guys pose for him and he had them in their complete uniform. And he took that and then he modeled it and then he made a mold of it so that he could cast it again and again and again um, by multiple production. Of course, that's the whole story of mass production. You can produce something more inexpensively. This is not, um, as with this equestrian Marcus Aurelius, where you had to have molds, piece molds, um, then reassembled, you didn't have, none of that issue about the material. So he, he made a, a plaster mold and then uh, he made one, I believe, and he sent it by train across the country so that everybody could see it. He also advertised its availability in the uh, magazines and in the newspapers, if you want one of these. Uh, so every time he got an order for one, there was, there was some variability in price because you could have one where the material that was put into the mold was zinc. That's the least expensive. Um, so you could have a zinc figure. And then once it's taken out, he put a, a bronze patina on it. Or you could have copper. Now, copper would be a little more expensive because you'd there'd be a sheet of copper put in the mold and you had to sort of hammer it into the mold instead of pouring it in. And that also then would be bronzed when it came out and then be put on either a brick or a stone base. So you could determine which price you want. The figures are all seven feet high and you could uh, put them wherever you wanted. In his advertising, oh, he patented this. Um, in his advertising, he said that there was at least one of these in every of, of the 48 states. Um, now I know there are almost 150 of them that survive. So you get this um, heroic everyman. The pose, Vikesny thought of this through very carefully. With his upraised arm, what he's holding is a grenade. Um, and it's meant to be a victory gesture. He's not, it's not a way as if he's about to throw that grenade. And the victory gesture makes him resemble the Statue of Liberty. So there he is in triumph on either side of him. Well, you can't see it in this one, but in, I think I can give you another one where you will. There are charred tree stumps and barbed wire. So he's going through the battlefield or has gone through the battlefield and there's the bayonet attached to his rifle. So as I say, you could buy them. And here's one that was a zinc one. It, it badly needed work and it finally fell over. But uh, so it's just hollow cast. There's the zinc, and then it's just bronzed on the exterior. And he also advertised 
that you could buy this for yourself as a 12 inch figure that was a lamp. So it's the base of a lamp. Instead of a grenade, he holds the light bulb and you put the shade there. So this is the Victory Memorial that probably was more seen by people after World War I in this country than any other. I'm going to go back a, a little bit more to the wars of America in um, Newark in, in the park, Memorial Park, to say a little bit more about this. I, this time, last time, I, I, said, well, I couldn't tell you exactly the date of this. Now I can give you the date. It is after the conclusion of World War I. This was 1926. Um, and the man who commissioned Borglum to do this was um, a Newark resident. He made a fortune. He sold furniture, and his main furniture store was on Market Street. But the idea of the most of the composition is, is Borglum's idea, and he, he talks about what he does. He, he was never a man to be shy about what he did. Uh, he said uh, the whole sword, remember that behind this, there's like a, a shaft of a sword extending beyond the sculpture, represents the American nation at a crisis, answering the call to arms. And he said he has freely developed the human condition without camouflage or chilling symbolism. Now, that's overstatement because there's plenty of symbolism in here. But he, in that he made sure to cover the range of um, um, people in different social situations and to include women as well as men. Here you see it from the back. And it has all the flair and drama of the grand heroic monuments of the past. You do see what a, a very complex piece this was. I mean, casting this, these would be many individual, individually cast, hollow cast figures that are then somehow bolted together on this uh, stone base. I myself think, oh, I'm gonna have to go up there to see more carefully how it's done. But he worked with uh, some, um, I think it was an Italian foundry that that helped him produce it. But there are 42 figures in here. So it's it's uh, very ambitious. And they all have this utter heroism, as you can see in the almost anthropomorphized horses. And that relentless forward move is there. It, moving into the future, into the battlefield, Utterly fearless. And in the forefront, a Revolutionary War figure and someone dressed in Civil War uh, uniform of the Union. And that is Amos Van Horn, the patron of it all. So his self-portrait. Borglum also put himself and his son in here somewhere. So uh, most of these memorials were, were um, privately financed or by, by groups rather than government. Now, going right to World War II, um, several quite singular works that weren't created to be uh, war memorials. This is a Coventry Cathedral in um, the central Midlands in England. And this is an early 19th century painting of it. You couldn't see it now because it no longer exists like that. Early in World War II in the Blitz of England, um, this was bombed. The whole center of Coventry was destroyed. The spire of the church survives, but the whole body of the church, this is a photograph you can see, is, is rubble.
Now here it's been somewhat cleaned. The, the, so the, the original church was the 15th century church and this was a, a cathedral. So there was a bishop here. This was an important church. It wasn't just that Coventry was an important industrial center that happened to get bombed. The church itself had, within the church hierarchy was very important. The prelates at, in this church are reported to have said the day after the bombing, we're going to leave this unrebuilt and this is going to be a monument of hope and reconciliation for the future. And that became a theme for everybody who came by. As you can see, Churchill came um, there or here, King George, Queen Elizabeth's father came. One of the few surviving bits of the spire that crashed down here, you see, and it says that, the, that he, he stood there the day after the battle uh, surveying this. And then it was in the late 50s for the first time, um, there was a decision to make a new church alongside. And there was a fair amount of dissension about this because people wanted this sort of the, the purity and the starkness of the, the old church to remain. Well, as you see, it's, it's tower does. And this would have been the apse end down here. But no, it was rebuilt and Queen Elizabeth came to the dedication of the new church. Benjamin Britten wrote the war requiem for that a moment. So it was, it's a singular and important moment in, in British post-war history. So there's that space now cleared out and it's for sometimes the events held here for meditation, um, it, it never meant to be re-roofed or reused. I'm gonna show you what's at the altar. In that day after the bombing, in that first walkthrough, the church's resident stonemason noticed two beams that had fallen from the inner wooden roof and they'd fallen in the shape of a cross. So he, he lashed them together with rope and then had them erected on the altar. And then also it was decided to put behind the altar, Father, forgive. So the theme of the whole memorial is there. That's called the charred cross. And something else was made from some of the uh, large nails that uh, had been um, in the roof. Three of them were put together to make this cross. And it's just called a cross of nails. And there's something like hundreds of them now. There's um, an industry producing this. Once all the original nails were used, there are men in a German prison who create these. And wherever they go, they are symbols of reconciliation. And any anything that has the name Coventry, like there was a, England had in the Falcons War, they had a, a sub that was called the Coventry. Um, it carried, had a cross like this, so, so they all do. And oh, well, they were around the world. And one of them is in Berlin. Here it is in the window of another church that was a war memorial. It's Kaiser Wilhelm Church in Berlin, as it used to be and as it is now. It was a kind of hideous pile, if you ask me, and not built until the 19th century in a kind of a retrospective medieval style. And when it was bombed, just this part of the tower, not the complete spire, uh, and base were all that survived. And the original intention was just to demolish the whole thing, but there was such a public outcry, um, not, not something coming from the church, um, of wanting to keep it, that that was such a, 
familiar monument from the center of Berlin while it was still there, even if it's not especially to be treated as a war memorial, which it has been, um, it should um, remain standing. So a church has been built all around it and then it's been incorporated. And there's like a memorial hall just under it in here. And a third one. So that's, I think that was from Allied bombing in the 1943. And this is the one in Hamburg, uh, Church of St. Nicholas, St. Nikolai, that which is a Gothic revival designed by a British architect in the 19th century. For a while, this was the tallest building in Europe. And this was bombed in the 43 also. Again, it's the spire and just a part that survives. And that's a memorial and it's a peace monument. The final one that's quite different from these and quite horrifying, you're getting the aerial view here and then I will mangle the name of it. This is in central France. It was a, just a ordinary, modest, small village. Oradour, O-R-A-D-O-U-R, Sur, S-U-R, Plan, G-L-A-N-E. in 1942, I believe it was. This small village was utterly destroyed by the men under the control of someone that even later the often SS were going to um, bring to trial for his barbarism in this. But he he died in combat before that was possible. And it was that there was had been a rumor that there was um, someone in this town had been involved in the the brutal killing of of um, one of the Wehrmacht members. And so the guy who was in charge of this unit said, um, what he had done was to corral everybody in the town. Um, all men were, well, I don't want to go too far with the barbarity, but it was totally barbarous. People were rounded up and um, put in buildings, and then the buildings were torched. So altogether, uh, out of, I think there was something like almost 650 people died and five survived, managed to escape. And that, that town, uh, Charles de Gaulle decided this, we are going to leave this exactly as it was. And that's just as it was. Here you see a bed, the frame, metal frame twisted from the heat. Or from another house, the sewing machine. Now, there are quite often ceremonies where dignitaries from, well, Germany, other countries, they come here also uh, observing this, uh, honoring the place. But, so this is the whole town as a memorial. And we're gonna go to Russia for just a bit. There was that statue of Peter the Great from the 18th century, um, looking out toward the sea and toward the West as all of his policies did. Uh, he effortlessly controls uh, a rearing horse. And there now you have even the rocks, everything makes the diagonal, a dynamic diagonal.
Let me look at a few, just several Russian World War II monuments. This is one of the most famous. Uh, you can see that it's large, and you're going to see that it's even larger in a moment. I mean, you'll more easily see that it's large. Well, here, look, there are people walking up. It wasn't um, completed until 1967. The, in the way these monuments carry many messages, not just about a war, there's another victory being proclaimed here. Um, which is, this was created during the time when Russia had totally recovered. It's the time of Sputnik, of, of great economic flourishing of Russia as a world power. And so these are then going up and they are exultant. That's just all they are. They are expressions of the, the power, the might, um, the glory of Russia. So this one is in what is now called Volgograd. Well, that's on the Volga, but it's the former Stalingrad, where the most terrible of all battles in the Western um, war was in, in Stalingrad, more casualties on both sides than any place else. And it was the point at which the Nazis began to pull back. So again, it's a spot where there could have been a tropeon, but it's to of course, honor all the dead. When it was erected, uh, publicity was that this was the tallest statue in the world. Uh, I think that had something to do with whether you figure the base in with it or not, because it, it's about the size of the Statue of Liberty. It's made out of Priestessed concrete. It is a, a technological marvel. Uh, it's largely hollow, sort of honeycombed units put together. Because <laughs> you couldn't have a figure lean forward like that of solid concrete down without more support. Um, but look the way this goes out here. That I mean, it's just the knowledge of uh, balance and statics and what the material can do is. Extraordinary. It, now they've had some trouble with it, parts of it, weakened. And this was a metal sword up here. The sword is the most significant part. There are actually three monuments. I'll show you another one that goes with this. And I don't didn't bring in the third. Um, the, they're stretched across. One's in Berlin, then this one, and then there's one in the South Urals. And that's I'll show you that one next. And they're all about the creation of a sword, the brandishing of a sword, and then putting the sword down. Uh, so it's a trilogy of great war memorials. They were done over time. And one of them's early, and then the others are in the 70s. But so this, this sword has this extra meaning. But here she is summoning, as if she were Mother Russia. Well, she is Mother Russia, summoning all her people, and she's facing the West. And of course, but of course. See her drapery splits there, the way her drapery flies out and her arm flies out. You can imagine there. So it, it exalts in the primacy or the potency of the West, but curiously enough, it's using, uh, well, of Russia rather than the West, but it, it's using a Western model in art. That's just part of the koine of the art of victory.
You'll remember that triumphal arch in North Korea where every stone in that was the equivalent of one year in the life of um, Kim Il-jung. Here there are 200 steps um, in the ascent. And that's equivalent to one, each step represents one day in the Battle of Stalingrad. Then this is the um, another part of this tree of them, and it's called rear front. <laughs> this is a, a very inelegant name for it. Um, these figures are about, um, I think they're about 50 feet high. They're, so they're not as big as the motherland calls, but it's about the forging of the steel for the sword. It's creating the weaponry of war. Uh, one figure, uh, worker faces, and this is a place called, let me just be sure I'm gonna include all the Magnitogorsk in the Southern Ur uh, Urals. And so those are the contemporary factories. Um, so the worker faces the factory. And then there's one figure, a soldier faces the West where the war was conducted. So that's East West. These are primarily bronze and stone. In the style of art that's characteristic of anything done within the purview of the government, um, it's just Soviet socialist realist style. No flaring draperies here. Sober strength. And quite a marvel because now you can see the other views don't show that not all hands are helping to support that. One last Russian monument, this in Leningrad, and it's um, just called the Monument to the Heroic Defenders of Leningrad during the siege of Leningrad. And this was in the 70s. It's a complete building complex. It, uh, We'll just look at a little bit of it. So there are to the dates of the war. And there's a, an eternal flame. Can't see hidden by that. And then I'll show you some of the... the uh, here are a few people walking around. So you can see these are all bronze figures and that they are well over life size. They celebrate both the military and the civilians who suffered such privation and showed such heroism during that harrowing time. and the starving civilians. And then we look at some, our monuments, uh, monuments on the mall. We'll look at, this, the DC War Memorial, the World War II Memorial. This was done first, then we'll also look at the Vietnam War. This was created first, this was second, this, then this, 
uh, we'll look at one that's not here too. I won't look at Korean War. This is quite, quite, quite a change from the sort of like testosterone steeped images we were just looking at. Um, this, is, this, is for, uh, this is the memorial for um, the District of Columbia. It's the only one for something other than um, a, a nationwide unit in the mall. And this was from 1930. And you see it's, it's extremely reticent. It just goes back to neoclassical form. It's a little bit like a, well, it's based on a Roman round temple. And the Pacific quality of this was that even when it was designed, it was like, this can serve as a bandstand. Yeah, so the whole, um, the, the Marine band I think can fit in here. Now it's a great spot for weddings, evidently. But the names of all those in who had um, died, I think, I don't know if it was just in World War I, I don't remember, but but the names of the dead or those who fought in World War I are um, inscribed on the base. And other than that, there's no imagery. So here you're looking at the uh, monument to uh, memorial to World War II. This was dedicated in 2004. I'm frankly, let's just say, I'm not enthusiastic about it. <clears throat> there was a lot of, uh, well, so here it would be here. There is a government involvement in this, anything this, this large. There was some um, hostility to it at first because it's, well, it's interrupting the, the axis between the Washington Monument and Lincoln Monument. And they will have to deal with that. This is the only one that, interrupts that whole prospect. And they deal with it because as in one way, so you come up here, there's a people, they're reading what's on here. And then, well, then we'll look at some other views. So you see, it's a series of um, steps. You come up to this um, ellipse, then there's a fountain with water well, and then there are sprays all around. Uh, on cross axis, two, as it were, triumphal arches, a curve back here, which we'll see. And then we'll look at a little more. There's much more on the outside. This tries to do everything. Including countering the objection to its placement on that axis. So I'm going to read what was written there because to my mind, it also almost, uh, I don't want to see that part of there. Excuse me, I think it's, it's just too much it has to be read. Yes, finally, I found it for you. You've read it, I'm sure, from the screen right away. But <clears throat> the verbosity of this is going to so contrast with the Vietnam Memorial. Here in the presence of Washington and Lincoln, one the eight, 18th century father and the other the 19th century preserver of our nation, we honor those 20th century Americans who took up the struggle during the Second World War 
and made the sacrifice to perpetuate the gift our forefathers entrusted to us, a nation conceived in liberty and justice. So it made, this is an inscription that gets in both Washington and Lincoln and ties them into the center. Now for the shape, well, there's a precedent. Think of the square in front of St. Peter's. Now, this particular aerial image does not show because I think they've been covered. There are two fountains here. As there are two fountains here. So just that swinging dynamic, this would be uh, probably a subliminal message for some, but not all. Uh, that That is um, bringing in the European context into this American monument and associated with a faith. And then the curve that bulged out at the back beyond that was this wall of stars. There are some 480 some stars that represent by a fraction, the number of American casualties during the war. So that's the apex of it all, the sacrifice of the Americans. And then around it, you have marching these, they're like steelies or like cenotaphs maybe. Are you thinking? Now we're looking at the cross axis of it. This just tries to do everything that represent all American territories and states. So, so you can see that Samoa is here. And they're arranged in the order, starting back where the stars were, of the order of their admittance into, um, to be under American government. So it's not alphabetical order, it's not, um, Geographical order, it's telling you something about the history of America through that. And then what is represented with these? There's a solid, <laughs> sorry, my cat is in the way here. Um, this slit in each of them, that re represents all the deaths during the war, the losses. And then on both the inside and the outside, there are wreaths. One wreath is oak, and I think the other is laurel. One represents industry, and then the other represents the arts. Then they're bound together by what looks like a, a braided bronze cord. That represents the unity of all American territories. These are many ideas to get across in one monument. And on this cross axis, there's something for the, the, the war in the Atlantic and the war in the Pacific. They are now presented as triumphal arches. And under the arch, there are eagles holding, hovering overhead, a wreath of victory. And then the floor beneath, is the uh, symbol of the Medal of Freedom, freedom given to everyone who fought in the war. More than that, there are scattered around on the walls, texts from significant figures who talked about the war. And special, special battles in the war. And reliefs of life during the war. This one of women working at home. Working on the plane. And even two of Kilroy was here because that was found in the European, um, where, where American soldiers went, they would, they would put this image up. Kilroy was here. So it tries to tell something about 
everybody's experience everywhere in the war. And well, as I say, I don't, I don't find that particularly effective. As opposed to the extremely laconic, but I think very effective, Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Now here, it didn't have to meet government standards initially. It was the veterans themselves who commissioned the college senior Maya Lin to um, design this. I mean, it was an open open proposal and, and she, she won it. It was, a, it was a blind submission so that until she won it, no one knew it was just a college student. These are part of her drawings for it. She said that she intended it to be like a gash in the ground that all of the earth suffers. And it's so bent on its axis that each end, one points to the Washington Monument, the other to the uh, Lincoln Memorial. And it's the names of all the many thousands of people who died in the war. They're listed in order that their deaths were recorded rather than alphabetically. And there are places where you can, if you're going to find some of there's a, a text alongside that you can get to that. It is like an open book. And that makes sense in that her mother was a poet. So, and she's very interested in things literary. So that's, and it also, to my mind, recalls the thing that this whole series began with, which was that monument at Marathon, where it's the dead under a mound. Well, now the dead are not here, but they're all represented in this below ground sequence of names. So like the book, you start by reading the right-hand page. Here it begins, 1959, and it goes in columns. And then it starts at the small end over here on the left. It works up to here, ending down here, 1975. No imagery. She... Explain that because this is so unlike almost everything we've seen, except that one monument from the Second Maryland um, unit at, at uh, Gettysburg. She said, This way, when people come and they see the name of someone they know, everything they know about that person can come to their mind. There's no attempt at trying to uh, present the generic heroic figure or the suffering figure or any figure that the totality of that person can come to you. So it's as if you're meeting them there. And that's why you see so often people touching this with the name. There's some symbolism in this, even with the names, the little divisions here these indicate people who are known dead. Here you see one, it's a cross. That's someone missing in action. If that person's remains are discovered, that will be converted into the same shape here. If the person is found to be alive, that becomes an oval. Now, for many people, they really felt the loss of an of an image that 
to be able to visualize this in, in terms of people in general. <clears throat> and here is another part of the monument from 1993, but this is this was put done by a, a woman, a, a sculptor named Glenna. So uh, there are the names of the eight women who died in the war up on the wall, but this would be the, the women who served in the war in whatever function, nurses, signals people, whatever. So there are three, three nurses and a gravely wounded man here. It too, seems to me, calls on the collective memory of um, collective Christian memory of um, sacrifice uh, against the um, inhumanity of others. Very different way of going about it than Coventry Cathedral to plea for something. Put that outstretched arm. You, you could almost call this socialist realist style. Then the Korean War Monument. Just do this really, really quickly. So they're still working on this, but these are stainless steel figures. So they're like a platoon. So in our age of uh, virtual reality, this is getting closer and closer to virtual reality. It's as if you can walk among them. Then on the wall, since there are other figures, non-Americans, and they're there. There are hordes more represented. the reality. Oh no, I know we just have three minutes. I'm going to pass beyond that. Because someone said last time, what about monuments to women? Yes, there are, but they're all created very recently. Here's one from the Gettysburg. It's to all women who did anything before, during, or after the war, really, uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, it's uh, based on a, a historical figure, a woman who with her husband had been caretakers of the cemetery there. And then while her husband fought, uh, she and her very elderly father took care of the dead and buried a number of them. And here she is shown six months pregnant and still doing that. So that's a quite realistic one. And then I finish with this one, which is very strange. Also early 20th century. This is in, in Whitehall in London to all the British women who fought in the war. Conceptualize as if you're looking down a hall where women who perform so many different op duties have just hung up their uniforms. So there's no person. The, there's a text on the sidewall, which we can't see here, that's in the typescript that was uh, typeface that we used in World War II ration books, but here. That's what we're going to end with. That's a long way from a tumulus, a mound in Greece, where again, you don't see the dead to this. Okay, and any questions, anything you want me to go back to, now's the time.
I guess I should assume, therefore, there's no one who has anything you want to follow up with. Hmm? All right. Goodbye. Thank you, Thank Maggie. You. Yeah. Always wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes, excellent. Thank you, Maggie. You. What are you doing next semester? I'm going to finish off Paris before uh, 1900. It's the big names it's Cezanne, Van Gogh, Gauguin. That's okay. Okay. Bye. That's okay. Bye bye. Enjoy the summer.